It's two o'clock on 1FM, time for John Peel to ask New Order, how does it feel? Introducing New Order, Bernard Barney Sumner, Peter Hook or Hookie to his friends, Stephen Morris and Gillian Gilbert. I think the thing with New Order is, is that the whole band were recruited not on their musical ability but on their ability to get on with each other. So I guess that's why we stuck together so long because the whole band was recruited on those principles and that, um, you know, we still get on with each other. <laughs> You've never done it before, so it's like the other perfect example for doing it. It's like, you know, trying a new sexual position is that you've never tried it before. You may as well, because you might like it. I still think it should have been called Carry On New Order, <laughs> and we could have had Sid and Hattie Jakes on the cover. But no, oh no, we have to be bloody serious again, don't we? Don't be Republic. of May this year, a certain Mancunian pop outfit released their seventh studio album, Republic, after a three-year absence. They're fresh from their solo projects, but still shaky from their move from factory to London records. Shortly, I shall ask them, how does it feel? But first, how did it begin? Factory record boss, quiz show host and raconteur Anthony H. Wilson recalls. I'd seen Warsaw, the uh, electric circus, the wonderful punk club. It was a paralysing mess of noise. And there was something about the lead singer, but God knows what it was. And then a few months later, they changed the name to Joy Division, and it was the night of the stiff Chiswick test at Rafters when 12 local bands played to see if we could get a record contract with Stiff or Chiswick or whatever. It was a, it was a wonderful post-punk event. Every group in Manchester played, all the hopefuls. And at five to two, Joy Division went on and played three numbers and had the plugs pulled on them. And it took about 30 seconds of the first number even, and suddenly it became absolutely clear because Joy Division was so completely and utterly different than every other group that had been on that night. The same night, I had met for the first time the uh, appalling DJ at Rafters, who was called Rob Breton, and he kept me in touch. He sent me the Ideal for Living EP, and I was managing, as I still do, a wonderful musician called Vinnie Riley, and we wanted to put the first record out. We wanted it to be a sampler, first commercial double seven inch since Magical Mystery Tour. And we wanted to put various things on it. And we looked around, there was this remarkable band sitting here in the town, and no one was knocking on their door to put a record out by them. So I just offered, and so came Digital and Glass. Digital by Warsaw, who became Joy Division. Apparently, it all began with punk rock. Peter Hook and old school friend Bernard Sumner decided after a Sex Pistols concert in 1977 that they were going to form a band. So did the rest of Manchester, actually. Peter Hook. Me and Bernard just used to sit in his uh, grandmother's front room, both plugged into an old stereo, just messing about, which was a thing. I mean, the main things we used to listen to at the time were just like the first Pistols record and the first Damned record. So it was Ian Curtis, really, that had the very wide musical influences that he passed on to me and Bernard. And uh, because the thing about the two Sex Pistols concerts were that, like the first one, there was hardly anybody there. There's only about 50 people. And all the people that mattered were there. And so we got to know them all. And as, like, the Buzzcocks moved on and started doing gigs, they we knew them. So it was, like, inevitable that, you know, Pete Shelley had asked us to support them, which was our first gig, supporting the Buzzcocks at Electric Circus. So it was just the way it progressed from just messing about, quite luckily, to the people that you knew who had started doing it, and they just brought you into it. Don't walk away. Silence. Don't walk away. The 
eloquent Tony Wilson talks about their first album. I think the success of Unknown Pleasures was so much fun for all of us. I think everybody enjoyed doing it. One of Ian's last things was a letter in which he said that he was enjoying it the way we were all doing it. And I think because it was fun, we never then questioned it. On the 18th of May, 1980, Ian Curtis committed suicide. Just one month later, Love Will Tear Us Apart went top 20. I think Love Will Tear Us Apart is a fitting tribute to Martin Hannett, really. The bravery of the way in a, a song that was a major pop song, the way he lets that guitar play and be through the breaks and the end, uh, I think it's more of a tribute to, um, to Martin. Um, I suppose for Ian, it's one always goes back more to unknown pleasures, really. There was a glowing romanticism about Love Will Tear Us Apart and Closer. So I think the tributes come more from the first album. Yeah. regrouped as New Order and continued to work with Hannett on their first single, Ceremony, a Joy Division song, as well as their first album offering, Movement. manager Rob Gretton. Well, I don't think the group particularly liked the production on Movement by Martin, but I mean, Martin was heavily uh, affected by Ian's death. I think what would have been quite interesting would have been for New Order to remix Movement, particularly if they did it now, they'd make uh, a better job of it than Martin. The songs on Movement are really good. I was telling a story about Martin Hunt the other day when, uh, when we were doing movement and he completely went. And he used to come in the studio and he used to lock himself in this cupboard with one little speaker. Before he locked the door, he'd say, if I hear anything I like, I'll come out. And he never came out until he went home.
I think it was interesting artistically to watch how, particularly the first album, Movement, uh, Barney was trying to write like Ian, trying to be Ian, trying to write lyrics like Ian, and his Elliot style. And it wasn't until Temptation that New Order found themselves actually living without Ian because Barney finally found his own voice. I always think the kind of almost nonsense, simplistic nature of the green eyes, blue eyes, grey eyes, whatever, was the beginning of Barney finding his own style. I think they laboured for a while under Ian's absence. Gillian Gilbert had settled in behind her keyboards, but whose idea was it to let the drummer's girlfriend join the band? Tell us, Tony, do. I've always looked back about a year later and thought, why the hell did we ever continue? One realised the personal loss, which you realised the artistic loss and really thought about it, why didn't one just give up? Uh, but at the time, it, there was a kind of a practical thing to it. Oh, I wonder what the replacement lead singer could be. And then Rob came up with his masterstroke of uh, moving the guitarist to the middle of stage and moving the drummer's girlfriend, who had played with the group before, to the position on stage where Barney was, and so the family wasn't disrupted. a singer. All I wanted to do was stand at the back and play my guitar or my synthesizer. So it was a bit like being thrown in at the deep end. And I just, well, I think my voice has got better through just experience, really, and um, working with producers who have helped me out. I mean, one of the big things was that we never used to put songs in the correct key for my voice, which meant that I had to sing supersonically high or really, really low, you know, ridiculously low um, to hit the key of the song. It was just impossible. And we did countless songs like that because we didn't know what we were doing and there was no one around to tell us. We were all learning at the beginning because Bernard had never sung before. And um, But, I mean, they knew how to write songs anyway because we were Joy Division. And so I learned about keyboards as I went along. I mean, they've not had music lessons, but I have piano lessons, so I sort of helped Bernard. I don't think it's bad not knowing a lot about music because 
I think you can know, get to know too much. I mean, when Bernard was going about keys, the early songs when we didn't know anything about keys, he used to actually strain, which, I mean, you reach the notes. But now, if you know about keys, you're never going to get out of that range, so I think you're limiting yourself. So with experimentation as the order of the day, the band stayed faithful to the DIY punk ethic. In fact, their most celebrated track was the result of playing with a new toy, Stephen Morris. Blue Monday was written to test me patience, basically. Um, yes, we had a drum machine. I mean, like a lot of our songs sort of tend to come as a result of a purchase of a new piece of equipment. I mean, why read the manual when you can write a song? It was just learning how this drum machine worked. Unfortunately, the trouble was it didn't work terribly well. Um, there's these things in computers, and people for that matter, called memories. And um, we bought the world's first amnesiac drum machine, which meant, basically, as soon as you turned it off, you had to turn it on and reprogram it again. And when you've written a song that's eight minutes long, it's a lot of uh, digit pushing. We realised then why Beethoven wrote his music on a piece of paper. Yeah, because he was deaf, obviously. But it helped us a lot, because Blue Monday was like a 12-foot-long sheet of paper, which we had to program, very like a knitting pattern. Very like a knitting pattern, if any. I do a bit of knitting in my spare time, as you do in the pot. There's been a lot of people who said Blue Monday was ripped off something else. I think it was Bobby O was one of the people who claimed to have written it, because he uh, did divine... Did, um, what was the one that Divine did? That was, what was basically Blue Monday, but funnily enough, he did it afterwards. Now, if he'd have done it before, I think that's a trick, really, with originality. It's getting in there first. Being original after the event isn't quite the same thing. And also, strangely enough, Arthur Baker is another claim to the I wrote Blue Monday me crown. Maybe it was just me. Maybe I was too busy pressing buttons to notice his presence in the room, but you know, he's a big lad, I'd have remembered. Those who came Pop star fashion, New Order chose not to put Blue Monday on their album of that time. I mean, what might have happened if we'd have put Blue Monday on Power Corruption and Lies? Would it have made it a bigger hit? Who knows? At that time, we were really opposed, and I must admit, in the heart of hearts, I still am to some extent, to the fact that the single is a promotional item to sell the album. I mean, uh, we've grown up a bit now and we're in the world of market forces and all that but in our young naive heyday if you like um, an album was an album like a coherent thing and that was one thing and a single was just a single it, they, like they were two completely separate entities particularly with Blue Monday which was like a 12 inch single if we'd have been on anybody apart from Factory like it would have been a 7 inch it would have been on the album it would have been remixed by Billy Eckstein probably and loads of things but because we were on Factory, we were allowed to do all that sort of stuff. Now, in a way, you could say it's a kind of retrograde step that we're going back to what we weren't doing then, which is like taking singles off albums. But I think that, that's something that I really miss, going out on Saturday, spending your three and sixpence on a seven-inch record or ten bob on an, on an EP because it had a cover and taking it home and playing it, yeah. Then watching your sister stamp on it. Power Corruption and Lies did not have Blue Monday on because of a five-second decision by the group. And Blue Monday sold one million and Power Corruption Lies sold 150,000. Pull the other one, Tony. Next you'll be saying you lost a penny on every copy. That's a lie. We did not lose a penny on every copy of Blue Monday. We lost about fourpence on every copy of Blue Monday sold. Um, we used to get 82p back for every one we sold. And the plastic and everything else cost 30p and the sleeve cost 40p, so we actually made two pence on every one. We split the two pence, one pence to New Order, one pence to us, and out of our one pence, we would then pay the 5p royalties. So we lost 4p on every one. 
I was producing one of the bands on Factory, which I used to do for free because I liked to, you know, think that I was helping out what I feel. And um, Tony Wilson turned up at the studio and um, walked into the control room, absolutely pissing himself, laughing. And uh, he said, guess what I've just found out? Guess what I've just found out? And this was after Blue Monday had just been a hit. And he said, you know how successful Blue Monday's been? I went, yeah, I know all that, I know all that. He said, well, I've just found out that the sleeves cost so much money to make that you're not making any money on it. Ha, 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 and started laughing. At which point I, I did start to think that there was something seriously wrong with their uh, business outlook. But you would have thought that if we could get our shit together to make the world's top selling 12 inch single of all time then they could have got the shit together to at least make sure they made some money out of it the single confusion followed in september 83 co-written by new york hip-hop producer arthur baker peter hook arthur baker was very interesting because before we went we thought he was this um demigod of producing when we got there and saw him in action, we realised he hadn't got a clue. He just did it all off the top of his head. And it sort of demystified the whole songwriting process. It was the first time we'd ever gone in the studio without a song written. And he encouraged us to, like, to um, jam and, you know, work on it and use the heat of the moment, man, you know, and all that. Lot. And we'd never done it before and we were mortified because he didn't know what he was doing. He was just really wild. So that, that was quite an interesting uh, sojourn. Treated into the studio. They had carved their niche in pop music culture and their style was evident in the albums that followed Low Life in 85 and Brotherhood from 86. Q Montage. I've watched your face for a long time. It's always the same. I studied the cracks and the records. You were always so. Can run. You 
Tony Wilson was unhappy with how the songs were marketed until 1987 and Substance. Substance did really well because it's the most wonderful collection of music, but Substance also did really well because it was the only time we ever actually did it half ways properly, i.e. put out a good single some weeks before an album comes out. And we'd never done that before and we never did it properly again, in fact. So just this one time we did it right and the single was True Faith. Faith got to number four, another dent in pop music history. It also won them an award for best video. They were an arty lot and modest. Rob Gretton. True Faith, until it was voted best video of the year, wasn't actually shown that much. It's not our best video by any means. I really like our videos. I mean, Barney's always complaining that they're uh, too arty or whatever. But I, I just think they're really good. Funny ones. Poppy one. never wanted to be a member of the BPI and he tried it one year and in that year we won um, best video for True Faith but the year after that I think it was like another 500 quid to stay a member so funnily enough he didn't pay him and uh, our membership lapsed but there was trouble when the band decided to put their strongest follow-up to True Faith on the B side of True Faith when we did 1963 I mean, I thought that should have been a single because um, it was good and I think you can be so arrogant or silly in a way to think that if I do an A and a B side, you know, people who appreciate it. Again, that was us being fools to ourselves. That was another sort of get-back that 
backfired because then, as now, like the B side of the record tends to be a remix or like some dub excursion into the realms of oh, we couldn't think of another <laughs> anything else to put on the B side, you know. And we thought, no, we'll rebel against that. What we'll do is we'll put another song on the B side, just like what the Beatles done. And unfortunately, I think we put rather too good a song on the B side because I think it would have been a very good single on its own. It was January 1963 when Johnny came home with a gift for me. He said, I bought it for you because I love you. And I bought it for you because it's your birthday too. He was so very nice. He was so very kind to think of me at this point. by major record companies, it was around the time of technique that the band thought seriously about bailing out of factory. I remember getting in my car and driving post haste down to uh, Bath, to the studio where they were recording technique to make factories plea for them to stay with factory. And I made a one hour speech talking about family, at, which, at the end of which someone in the room said, yeah, it's a family, we all hate each other. But um, I think it was Hooky, really. I mean, Hooky was the one who said, you know, he didn't want to go anywhere else. And I think he led the general feeling to, at that point, stay and to, to do technique and then world emotions. We were offered deals all the time by our major companies. I mean, obviously, the best thing would be to have your own record company. Why we never did that, I don't know. Technique was the album of holiday hysteria. Recorded in Ibiza, it was a celebration of the Englishman abroad. Mr Disco, I wanted to write a chicken in the basket song for everyone in San Antonio and everyone in uh, Benidorm who sits in discos and has chicken in a basket. Not being condescending, but when I write a song, I like to think of a reason or a public to write it to. It was their next collaboration that truly saw them playing for England, their biggest hit to date. I suppose that was your idea, Tony. The idea for World Emotion was that of David Bloomfield, the son of Jimmy Bloomfield, famous football player and manager. David Bloomfield was the, uh, still is, press officer at the Football Association. In fact, it's really rather sad, actually, because there were two things on the go at the time. The other was to make a film with the great, legendary English filmmaker, Michael Powell called Sands of D, or do the England football song. And I fought very hard that they would do that. Whenever I fight very hard for something, I normally get shot on for doing it, as with the famous single Round and Round, which is eternally blamed on me. Um, so with this one, Michael Powell's death is eternally blamed on me now, because obviously he died shortly 
after we finished World in Motion, so they never worked with Michael Powell. And Bernard told me very pleasantly one night, you know, Michael Powell was my favourite film director, so I took that as a personal criticism. However, World in Motion happened and the, uh, the Sands of D didn't. And I think culture got a, a better thing. Well, some of the crowd are on the pitch. Culture got a better thing, and New Order got a number one record. Well, it wasn't really like being number one, because it was called England New Order. If you look in the uh, Guinness Book of Hit Records, it doesn't actually have number one under New Order. It has number one under England New Order, whereas essentially it was really a New Order record. don't talk about World in Motion, they probably wished they'd done the Sands of D instead. By this time, they were fairly cynical about Factory's working practices. The moral issues or whatever that were the foundations of Factory indirectly sort of led to his downfall and also our lack of enthusiasm, if that's the word for it, because it was, hey, no contracts with the bands, which in the early days, that's it's really right on, man, isn't it? Don't have a contract. So OMD went to Virgin, the Railway Children went to Virgin. What were they? An A&R department for Virgin. Um, but ultimately, because we were sort of mates, you don't like doing the dirty on your mates, really. Factory's great ethics and stuff 
uh, at certain points, certain ones went by the wayside, like the no press, no promotion we gave up on in 85 because we realized we'd become a dinosaur and we were actually not doing service to our groups. The not campaigning an album, you know, we, we turned around when we did True Faith and Substance and found we enjoyed it, so we did it from then onwards. Um, not having contracts. When, you know, Railway Children left us, 52nd Street left us, and then when James left us, it was like, well, hold on, you can't keep building a band and then they leave you. It's like, you know, to have any fun here, we should have more than one band. We shouldn't be just New Order and rely on them so much. I miss the personnel at Factory. I really like Alan. I like Tony. And I miss some of the chaos there, but it's nice to get paid for what you do at the end of the day. I think um, they did have a refreshing attitude, Factory. But one of the sad things is that they didn't consummate the uh, original idea of what it was. And they had every opportunity to be a mega, mega successful label. They had um, the Mondays, Electronic and New Order, who all sold a lot of records. And there's no excuse for not being successful. Maybe people feel that we've betrayed our stance of independence. I guess the answer is, is that we didn't betray independence, independence betrayed us. I think everybody's image contributed to the overall mythic quality. There was a similarity in the nature of both organisations, both the groups and the, the company, that, with, although with different personalities, they were all um, rather strange personalities, and I think it helped everybody. And I think the role of the Hacienda in the midst of all this shouldn't be underestimated. It's been a, a financial nightmare for everybody for 11 years, been the cause of more horrendous meetings than I'm sure God even has, and yet... No one ever puts, can actually put a value on what the Hacienda's existence did for New Order or for Factory and the way it fed into the general feeling of this culture that was being projected. That's one of your favourite subjects, Peter. The whole Manchester thing was just an invention by the press, to my mind. That's like saying that, you know, because of the Hacienda and where the Mondays were in Northside, it's like people, because they don't read about it, think that it's gone. I mean, you know, that's just total rubbish, because if you've got the Hacienda on a Friday or a Saturday... It's even more happening now than it was then. You know, it's just nice that you've got rid of all your tourists and your journalists. You know, it's like the proper people who should be in can't get in because all the, these turkeys are walking about, you know. It's like you can go to Hacienda any night of the week and it's full of bleeding musicians and no-one gives up monkeys. That star thing doesn't exist, which I, I think is great. Peter Hook often looks wistfully from the bar of the Hacienda onto a dance floor culture that he in part created. But where have they been since the summer of 90, when England was still playing a reasonable game of football? It's a bit unfair to say you've not been doing anything, which is what everybody infers to you. You know, you've been probably been busier in these past four years than you ever have been in your life with Factory, the Hacienda, all your solo projects and New Order. And it's been a very uh, ah, wild time. excursion into New Order's extracurricular activities then. How's Revenge going, Peter? Revenge is going fine. I'm about halfway through an album now, about six songs. So it's still very current. I mean, it's uh, it's quite nice, really, in the way that all our solo projects have become very dear to our heart, even though it doesn't make ideal working conditions for New Order, but I think that you need it as a person. And what happened was you had a break and you came back, and it was nice to see everybody again, whereas before you were just sick to death of everybody. Since Bernard said Arrivederci to his pals, he's been pumping out the pop hits with Johnny Marr and Electronic. I want the best of both worlds, really. I find that in Electronic, it's a lot easier working in a recording studio because you don't have to satisfy the needs of another three musicians and a producer. It's good to work with other musicians, basically, because you've got to learn from somewhere, you can only learn so much off each other and after ten years I think you'll stop learning off each other. 
So it's good to play with other musicians to find out what their experiences are and the way that they do things. For instance, with electronic, we work with the Pet Shop Boys and they work in a completely different way. Everything is preconceived with Neil Tennant. And, you know, with New Order, it's not like that. We just do it and think about it afterwards. And I think it's the same with electronic. We just do it and then pick up the pieces later on because we do it very much by instinct, really, rather than intellect. recorded a single now that we've got to mix but we're going to bring that out after new order and we're going to be working with um Carl Bartos and Wolfgang Fleur from Kraftwerk. Even the keyboard player and her boyfriend have taken time off from their farm to record a new album as the other two. You. Because the two of us, really. <laughs> yes, we've done our own album, which uh, hopefully won't turn into be like the uh, Pyramids of a Sphinx, something that uh, people only discover after we're dead. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it'll be out before the end of the year, our album, shortly after this new order records. And so we come to Republic. Produced by Stephen Haig, it was made during the two and a half years of uncertainty with Factory and, under the guidance of their new label London Records, has seen them do a top-of-the-pop satellite link-up from L.A. on a beach with the cast of Baywatch. David Hasselhoff is very tall, actually. Tall, dark and handsome. Mr. L.A. I thought there was a few too many scantily clad young ladies in that video, actually, myself. Peter was into it, though. Steve was into it. Gillian had a hunk in front of her. And um, I was a bit disgusted myself. But it was actually less nerve-wracking than doing Top of the Pops. I don't know why that is. But um, I think the kind of bizarreness of the situation helped. I mean, I saw it as like a, an Elvis movie. Maybe I've forgotten the name and the address Of everyone I've ever known There's nothing I regret Save it for another day It's the school lads and the kids have run away I would like a place I could come up home Have a come 
is um, a typical New Order song it's got all the elements in it of a classic New Order track and it's good that there's some kind of continuity there for people to hold on to So Stephen Haig didn't do that much then? Normally when we produce something ourselves I'm very obsessive with any particular song I won't drop that song out of my hand I can't let it out of my system until it's finished but working with a producer you've got to take a different attitude in that you've got to give it to someone and forget about it for a couple of weeks and then they give it back and they've worked on it a bit and then you put the vocals on and I found that um, a bit difficult really. I think he's made a very classic New Order LP and what we would have done when we mixed it we would have put things in to make it less New Order because the strange thing I find about all of us is that you know we'll sit there doing a track and writing it and then we'll say it sounds too New Order that and you're thinking well and if we can't sound New Order, you can. No one can, Hooky. Even in remix style, New Order are unique. World, the band's third single from Republic, is released on August the 23rd, along with an ever so trendy dance mix. Have they finally sold their souls to the devil? Well, I think the sad thing is it's a marketing device these days. Everyone does a remix because if you release a remix, it helps your record sales. I'd like to release an album of just New Order remixes. It's always nice to know what um, <clears throat> someone else's angle on your song is. celebrated their second number one album in true rock and roll fashion, as you'd expect from a band with New Order's reputation. I mean, we heard we were number one, and then we got on this train on Sunday on the way down, and there was no bar on it, and it was the longest train journey ever. And, you know, when you got nothing to drink, Oki okay, went and nicked some ice cubes, so we celebrated being number one by sucking ice cubes, and uh, Gillian had the foresight to bring a packet of quavers with it, and... Uh, you know, you do look at quavers in a whole new light when you're number one. 
So it was a bit of a disappointment, really, a bit of an anti-climax, but Bernard made up for it later on by, uh, you know, doing his usual performance of turning to Mr Chucky, which is, you know, like seeing all your past dinners flash in front of you, if you know what I mean. And that burningly important question? No, we don't drink Sunkist. Our brief foray in the advertising world came to naught, as they say, um... You know, just putting loads of notes on this figure and sticking it in front of Bernard to try and muster a bit of enthusiasm still couldn't, you know... He still didn't have enough lack of sincerity to make it in the advertising world. Learn how to fake sincerity and the rest is easy. Um, no. We're, yeah, we're looking for sponsorship deals, Boddington's perhaps, somebody like that, with a you know, real intellectual bent. I don't think the release of the back catalogue or anything like that, I don't think it achieves anything in those sense. The only thing that will achieve something is if some intelligent, wonderful human being at an advertising agency in London decides to use transmission, level tears apart, on an advert. They got round to the clash, maybe they're going to go forward a year, and culturally, someone will get round to it. And I don't mind if it's for... Well, it would be a bit awful if it was for Femidons or something, but, I mean, it doesn't matter that it would be an advert if it could actually, you know, make people... The, it would open them up to one of the most wonderful bands that Britain has ever produced. I think, you know, I mean, Ian going 24 hours before they hit America, America never got them. Now, they haven't had much help, really, over the last 15 years. Maybe not, but they did have a plan. The plan was to grow slowly rather than be an overnight sensation. I think I said never peak, never to peak, till right at the end. But you've had a riot over the last 17 years, haven't you, Rob? Well, we've had a few riots, actually, in our time. We had a good one in uh, Boston as New Order. It's a similar thing about not doing an encore. And uh, the crowd wrecked the hall, about two or 3,000. And that was because nobody asked the band to do an encore. And after the concert, the crowd were waiting for us. So we got out and gave them a good leathering. Most of them were girls, actually. <laughs> Instead of having breakfast, we had melon ball. God, it was terrible. I had triple vision. And uh, got to the gig, and I went and sat in this bar outside. And this guy came nuts. He said, are you out of New Order? I said, yeah. He said, they're on stage now. And I thought, oh, bollocks, he's winding me up there. So I just carried on, and they were. And ended in a riot, because I, I didn't get there till about six songs, and Rob was playing cymbals. Oh, they're awful, them melon balls. Triple vodka. We had ten of them each. The audience went berserk. And we didn't do an encore, and we had, we had a full-scale riot. It's called Riot's Police at North. And the guy said to us, those immortal words, you'll never play in Washington again. Last month, New Order played to full stadiums in Hollywood, Dallas, Chicago and New York. They decided not to play in Washington. Now I stand here waiting. Feel was produced for 1FM by Syrah Hussain.